the expert. And I'm super excited today that I've got Hannah Pryor joining us and we're going to get into it in a minute. Um, but first, what I want to do is just uh, take just a minute to acknowledge the fact that we are here on the territory of many nations um, in Canada, traditional uh, Indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, Wendat peoples. And now Toronto, the beautiful city that we live in, is the home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. And so I just want to take a minute and acknowledge that we are here and are very lucky to be here um, as a result and, and send some love to all of our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Those of you who know the Roundtable know that we've been on a bit of a mission over the last uh, year and a half or so to um, fund some student uh, post-secondary education with our through our partnership with Inspire. And I get a lot of our members asking, how can we support? How can we be involved? Um, there's lots of ways you can do it. One is just to donate directly to Inspire yourself. Go and talk to your organization to see if they've got any um, you know, support of Indigenous youth, what their programs are. It's very easy to um, support um, through various bursaries and programs. And for us, any referrals that we get, we take 10% of that revenue and put it towards a bursary. We've made a five-year commitment, but any additional monies we get, we can fund more. And so we've been able to fund a couple more bursaries as a result. And um, we're trying to fund 215. And 215, for those in Canada, know that that is because those were the number of children that were found at the residential school in BC. So um, Kamloops Residential School. So we're trying to give 215 students their dreams. So help us out if you can. Um, in terms of those of you who may be new to the roundtable, I'm just going to give you a real quick overview of how we think about leadership and what we really sort of are on a mission to do here. We often get people calling us asking for leadership training or coaching and that we you know it's like the tip of the iceberg and what really people are really asking for when they're asking us to help them is that they're asking for a change they're asking for something to be better and it's typically at the end of the day they want exceptional leadership they want exceptional teams and they want exceptional culture and so but even below that you know those are things that you can do in isolation you can kind of train a leader you can work with a team you can you know work on culture but for us our goal in working with all of our clients is to help really unleash collective impact so how do we sort of really shift our mindsets away from this notion of heroic leadership where everybody's got to have it all figured out to collective leadership where we all work together and the solution becomes about us and what we do. So we've developed a number of systems to help uh, organizations and individuals do that and happy to kind of talk more about that with anybody who's interested. But we are here for a much more exciting reason today and that is to talk to Hannah and I'm super pumped because um, awkwardness, I feel like I I have embraced awkward my entire life and it was so great to kind of come across you and then see the book. Cause I think we met just as you were still maybe putting the finishing touches on your mm -hmm. book. Um, yeah. about to get ready for launch. So Hannah is a two times TEDx speaker. She is a performance consultant. She had an illustrious career in recruiting was in the top 10% of her field. So this is somebody who's been doing this work from the inside out, knowing this work, and then decided to sort of shift gears a bit, right? And and go into, um, you know, helping others um, based on what you've learned over the course of your career. And so great that you've done that. So I know you've been in book launch mode for the last few months, getting the book out mm -hmm. there, good, awkward. Yeah. So tell us what is exciting for you right now in this moment in time? Ah, thank you. First of all, I'm so happy to be here. And um, Kenzie, thank you for trying to work out the, the chat thing. So hopefully if they can't, you know, again, we've got, luck, you know, luckily in this sense, a slightly intimate group. So as we go on later on, um, you know, hopefully there will be opportunity to engage in other ways. But uh, what excites me right now? I mean, the book launch has monopolized my whole life <laughs> and, and I'm being dr dramatic in that statement. But what excites me right now is you know, now that the book is out, what's happening in this moment in time is people have read it. I, I think we've, I've had the chance to now hear feedback from those who have gotten to the end. Mm. And what's so much more satisfying than the splashy launch or the accolades or, you know, your 
well-known friends holding up pictures of it is when the book sets out to do exactly what you hoped it would do, which is help people feel seen, give them a ton of insight and aha moments about the way that they show up. Mm. And, you know, most importantly to me, they're like, you know, not only did you kind of shake me and, and help me change the way I thought, but I laughed out loud. I had fun while I was reading it. And so that to me feels exciting. And I hope that that momentum just carries the whole movement forward because that's what it's about to me more than the book itself. Yeah. So, I mean, it's such an interesting topic and I'm always curious as the origin story of how did you get interested in this topic of awkwardness yeah. and what made you decide to kind of dive down this pathway? Yes. Um, it always starts with an origin story. So it's funny because people meet me now and they're like, keynote speaker, or you're pretty eloquent and well-spoken. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, that, that is years of training and practice and conditioning. I felt impossibly awkward for pretty much the entirety of my adolescence. My parents are immigrants to the United States. My mom was born in Pakistan. My dad was born in India. Um, you know, outside of every photo I show you, you, you'll laugh just because they're all, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to dress. My parents didn't know how to dress me. I was always kind of sticking out when all I wanted to do was fit in. I think Absolutely. most, yeah, most children of immigrants, especially, but really any children, but especially children of immigrants know the story of just wanting to assimilate, mm -hmm. right? Our bumpy edges are on display. And I really just, why am I Henna? I want to be Samantha or Jessica mm -hmm. or Jennifer, yeah. right? Just with all the early eighties names that I was dying to have. So origin story, but I'll, I'll fast forward that, that followed me pretty much through high school and college In college. I think I started to come into my own a little bit, found the other people who maybe didn't mind when their jagged edges were showing, but the whole deep dive began when our queen Brene Brown burst onto the scene and started doing all that wonderful work. And we all fell in love with her. But the one thing that really grabbed me was that at the end of her podcasts and at the end of her interviews, she would use this tagline, this mm. mantra, stay awkward, brave, and kind. Mm -hmm. And every time I said it, I'm like, I love it. But then my second reaction was stay brave. Okay. Yep. I know how important that is. Stay kind. Yes. My parents have always taught me to be kind. Stay awkward. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to fight this my whole life, crazy lady. Yeah. Like, no, no way. I don't want to stay awkward. Yeah. And so I got really curious about that specific emotion and the way it shows up for us at work and in our professional growth. Mm. I love it. And I think um, when I first saw the title, I had the same reaction of your book. I saw good, awkward. And I thought that seems yeah. like an oxymoron to me, like good, awkward. So tell yeah. me about that. Talk to me a little bit about what good, awkward means. Yes. Uh, for most of my life, I'll give you the, the reverse. I only knew bad awkward, which is <laughs> I, you know, I would speak up to try to say something in a room of my peers or, you know, in my first job and it didn't go well. And I never wanted to do it again. Mm -hmm. Right. I just, I shrunk. I'm like, Nope. Okay. You idiot. You opened your mouth and look, look where that got you. Right. It was oh, always yeah. impossible. And I was the ruminator, I would have, you know, an awkward moment, an embarrassing moment. And I would replay it in the shower, in the car. I would literally sometimes out loud, like, what should I have said? And I just spun on what should have been. And part of the examination of that behavior really ties to, you know, awkwardness is a social emotion, meaning you don't tend to experience it when you're by yourself. So <laughs> earlier today, right before this call, even though I had written it down the last time we met, I mispronounced Glein's name. And in that <laughs> moment, I was like, oh God, because awkwardness is an emotion that we feel when the person that we believe ourselves to be or our true self is momentarily at odds with the person other people see on display. Mm. And in that gap, we experience this emotion of awkwardness. It's social in that if I did that by myself before the call, I probably wouldn't have felt awkward about it. Mm -hmm. but I did it in front of you and Kenzie. And so all of a sudden there's this flash of, oh God, because the person I believe myself to be is someone who is very careful about names. I am someone whose name has been mispronounced my whole life. And in that moment, you saw someone who got it wrong mm -hmm. or was ca careless about it. And so it's navigating that tension space. And so when we think about good, awkward, it's how do we get good at that tension space? How do we not get stuck, get hooked? How do we improve our comeback rate and actually lean into it instead of running away from it and avoiding the next time? 
Mm. Yeah, I love that. And you know, and it's funny because names are one of those things. And I, my name, Glein, gets mm. mispronounced. I always joke around with people who, um, you know, try my name without asking me how to pronounce it. And I have to correct them, which is an awkward thing in itself. Like I yeah. feel very awkward about correcting people. And yes, it's funny because I, I, I often wonder like, why am I feeling awkward about correcting somebody on how to pronounce my name? And it can become a thing for me too, where if you mispronounce my name, the first time I correct you, the second time I'll yeah. correct you. The third time I do this thing where it becomes so awkward that I actually withdraw. And yeah. so I'm curious, what are the patterns that we can get into with awkwardness? Because I don't think that's a good pattern for me. It's not good for me to allow people to continue sure. to mispronounce my name, but how yeah. do you sort of yeah, that back way? into that. Yeah, no, I love that. And I've I've been there, you know, in my in my TEDx about this, my opening story is I allowed my partner to call me Helen for yeah. months, for months. And so talk about when the awkwardness would just build on one yeah. another. By the time yeah. I finally got around to it, it was even worse because yeah. ironically, the avoidance of awkwardness increases awkwardness. Yes. Right? <laughs> when you when we don't address it the first time. And so, you know, essentially what happens at lightning speed and often subconsciously is we start telling ourselves a story. So I mentioned that awkwardness relates to the social discomfort. We don't tend to experience it on our own. More specifically, awkwardness is a self-conscious emotion, mm -hmm. which means it's rooted in people's perception of us. Mm -hmm. So we're not just asking ourselves, who are we? We're asking ourselves, who do other people see? Mm -hmm. And more importantly, do they approve of who they see? Right. So, you know, those first couple of times, maybe the stakes felt lower, right? I, I, I tried, I said it again. By the third time, whether it's conscious or not, there's a little bit of a perception of, I did this and now am I nagging? Now I'm, I'm, am I going to come across as someone who is really, you know, making them feel uncomfortable? There's yeah. an approval element that we start to become afraid yeah. of risking. And yeah. so we tend to forego our own identity. You know, you, I, I suspect Glein, as I am, as a henna, you are someone who it matters to you to have your name pronounced correctly. Mm -hmm. But we let that, you know, fear of losing the approval in that moment win mm -hmm. out. That mm -hmm. fear of awkward emotion win out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, and, and I think it's something that it's about, you know, taking a risk really, which I know you talk a yeah. lot about in the book is this idea of, when you're, you know, when you're holding yourself back as I'm, as I'm listening to you talk, I think it's so much of it is around risk. I don't want to take the risk of the relationship. I don't want to yep. risk that person looking bad. So talk to us a bit about, you know, risk and, and awkwardness. Yeah. Personally, professionally. Yes. So I'm going to draw the connection, but I want to maybe give a little context first. Mm -hmm. So why awkwardness and why now? Mm -hmm. So when I think about this emotion in this term and why we need to think about it now is we are living in a society and in, in a professional world where we are continuing to optimize for social smoothness. Yes. So what I mean by this is, you know, many of us are hybrid. Many of us are remote. We don't have to have that, that bumping accidentally into someone in the hall. We don't have as many opportunities for that water cooler chat where we say the wrong thing, but then have a, a chance to practice walking it back. We live in a world now where communications happen, you know, not in real time. I'll send you a Slack or a DM. You'll have a chance to think about it and respond mm -hmm. or where, you know, even just forget about professionally, even personally, people are dating via swipes. You know, I often remind folks that when I went to a friend's house, when I was younger, I had to ring the doorbell. My right. daughter is like text, text here from your phone, right? Text them that we're here. We don't even get out of the car. Yeah. We order our food online. We don't call the restaurant. You know, there's so many moments where human to human social interaction is no longer required. And so what we're seeing is a weakening of our social musculature. Mm, it's a great point. Yeah. We're just not having chances the way we used to, to have those moments where having a social response on the fly is necessary. It's just not. And so what we're finding is that when somebody is thinking about taking a risk at work, a professional risk, often those risks are not taken in isolation. 
Mm. Most of us work on teams. Most of us are trying to raise our hand in a meeting. Most of us want to negotiate with our leader, right? For, for more money, for a project. Usually these risks are not happening in isolation. Mm -hmm. So when we think about our social muscles, when we're not exercising them in the small stakes moments, what happens is we really struggle in those big stakes moments. We have an agenda that this is how this interaction is going to go. It doesn't because life, life is uncertain. It doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. And we are less primed to recover from it well because those muscles are weak. And so oh. this is where it's just important right now. Hannah, I, I I think this is so bang on. And I see, you know, I was sharing that my daughter turns 20 today mm-hmm. and I'm constantly saying to her, I'm fascinated by what you consider to be awkward. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, can't, I can't just call my friend and see if she wants to hang out. Yeah. What are you talking about right now? And I, mm-hmm. I love this. I, I think this is so very true. The weakening of the, you know, the, these, these muscles. And then when we think about, um, you know, people coming into the workplace, which, you know, a lot of the folks on this call, managers dealing with, you know, uh, next generation of employees, there's things that we expect people to ask for or push for. I'm Gen X. I expect to hear those things and they're not and so I hear a lot with the the folks that I work with what's wrong with and but I think you've just illuminated something for me which is a lot of the muscles are atrophying and they're and they've really kind of atrophied over COVID too didn't they like oh yeah so I love that you brought that up because often when I speak on this subject they think you know awkwardness oh this must be for introverts Mm, I am not an introvert Mm. I am 100% an extrovert like I don't think my well ever runs out of time I could spend with other people. I find it very enlivening. Mm -hmm. And what actually came out of the pandemic was some research that really anchored in what you've just said. There was, there was some early research that happened before the pandemic about jobs that are more isolated by nature, things like astronauts and polar explorers, Mm -hmm. you know, they are more isolated. And what they found when they studied those professions is that their social muscles atrophy when they come back to quote unquote, the real world they've started to lose the ability to read people's facial cues Hmm. or gestures, Hmm. right? And so in the pandemic, we all became astronauts or polar explorers to a degree. We all went into isolation. We only learned how to read the cues of our immediate nuclear unit, assuming we lived with people. If we lived by ourselves, even less so. And Hmm. so one of the opening stories I share in the book is one of my first meetings it, you know, back, back in the field, when the restrictions started to lift, I was meeting with a leader. I was pitching him for a huge training project, 15 minutes. You know, I was in sales for 14 years. I was like crushing it. I'm crushing it. Yeah, he yeah. puts his hand up in front of his face and I give him a big old high five. Cause I'm like, this is just, this is rocking. And he says to me, and I'll never forget it. It still haunts me. He says, <laughs> Hannah, I was putting my hand in front of my face because I was trying to tell you to stop. Mm. And I remember thinking to myself in that moment, you've forgotten how to human, (laughs) you've forgotten how to people, right? So this is not just for introverts. All of us can lose the ability to read people. Now in that moment, thankfully I had been doing this research. I knew exactly how to recover, but it is common for extroverts, introverts, and everyone to have awkward moments because it is just something that is happening as a function of our society being design the way it currently is. Mm-hmm. So what, I mean, what suggestions do you have? Cause I, I think I, and I'm seeing it, you know, I think uh, we've been online, all of our, you know, uh, coaching programs had switched to online over the pandemic. Yep. And I had one group that I was working with and we'd been together through the uh, pandemic. Everybody's, you know, really close, really bonded, you know, there's always, you know, there's often tears in roundtable programs because people go pretty deep yeah. and, for the graduation session, I said, Hey, why don't we do it in person? Like, because the restrictions had lifted, we had an opportunity to come in person. So yeah, that sounded like great idea to everybody. So we go in person and I happened to be late. Um, they moved to a new building. It took me a while to get into the room. So I got in later than the rest of the group and they were all in there. And I walked into that room and I just thought, what is going on in this room right now? I, I can already guess, but tell me. <laughs> It was the weirdest vibe I'd ever had in a group of people who had spent almost mm-hmm. 11 months together 
you know, supporting each other, telling each other their biggest struggles and concerns and everything. And now all of a sudden they were face to face. And when I did my check-in around the table, I, I said, so give us a feeling word. How are you feeling? And I think awkward came out like yeah. four out of eight times, weird, awkward. And it was such an aha to me. And I remember coming back and saying to the team, okay, we need to be really mindful of people's ability to transition back into this. It was almost mm. like what my analogy was, it's almost like when you're in traffic and somebody cuts you off and you decide that you're going to give them a rude sign or, you know, shake your hands at them. And then you pull in the parking lot and they they pull in right beside you and you have to get out of the car and eyeball them. And actually and look at them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was sort of that feeling, right? Um, so I, I'm curious, like what advice you have, because I, I think this is such a, a thing that, that many people are wrestling with and continue to really wrestle with, depending on what happened for you over the last three years. Yeah. Do you have any sort of tips or tools to, to flex this muscle, to bring this muscle back again, back to life? Yes. Um, a number of things. So I'll share first that this is a two-part process. Mm. So to, to get comfortable to embrace awkwardness. Remember, let me just kind of remind everyone, awkwardness is for everyone. To eliminate awkwardness is to eliminate uncertainty from your life. Mm -hmm. So good luck with that. <laughs> and if you figure that out, you just call us and mm -hmm. let us know because we're all curious. But the goal is to embrace. So it's a two-parter. Mm -hmm. It's part one is awareness. You know, in the coaching communities, we know the value, the, the, you know, superpower that is self-awareness, mm -hmm. but specifically awareness around this particular emotion. And so when it comes to this particular emotion, again, it's a social emotion and therefore very strongly tied to the stories we tell around approval. Mm -hmm. So often, you know, I was born into a South Asian culture where it's, you know, don't stand out too much, right? Don't, right. don't kind of make noise yeah. or push against the norm too much. Yeah. What will people think? I mean, I heard, there's an expression in Urdu my parents would use all the time. It's, you know, lo kya kenge, which means like, what will people think? Right. What will people think? That was, yeah. you know, ingrained in me growing up. And so when I think about my own experience with that emotion at work, there's a lot of that inner story that I still have to wrestle with. What will people think? And so mm -hmm. it's untangling some of our, our narratives that we've been told through the help of a coach or a mentor or a therapist or a yeah. friend, right? Can yeah. we do that work? Um, I love the framing from Professor Dan McAdams out of Northwestern. He says, when it comes to any moment of discomfort, awkwardness among them or embarrassment among them, do we tell ourselves contamination stories or do we tell ourselves redemptive stories? Mm. Contamination stories are, you know, that was so awkward. I hate that feeling. I'm ruminating on it for hours. I'm never going to do that thing again. I'm never going to correct someone who said my name wrong. I'm never going to raise my hand in the meeting and offer an idea that I'm not 100% sure about. That experience contaminated the future micro risk that you hoped to take versus really the hunting for the good, the redemptive story, even in an embarrassing or awkward moment, you know, that feeling sucked, but I tried something that I don't normally try. I stood up and walked to the stage when I don't normally do so. I raised my hand, even though I don't typically, and for that, celebrating the attempt, right? Mm -hmm. Part two, and I think we've started to talk about it, is conditioning. And I am very hell-bent on this. This is a repetition and rehearsal focus. We have to create spaces professionally for repetitions, but we can also practice this personally. So on the professional level, I teach leaders open meetings, five minutes, if you're having a team meeting, with things like a bad idea brainstorm. For the next five minutes, we're going to share ideas that are wildly unrealistic. People are like, why would we do that? Because believe it or not, even some wildly unrealistic stuff bubbles up some gems, but more importantly, it takes people's guard down. And the ideas that actually follow are more generative, more creative, more innovative. We can also share cracked egg stories, you know, times in the last week or two that I, something went sideways. I fell on my face. I had a huge blunder. I embarrassed myself, but we're not hearing about these across the cubicle anymore. Mm. So we have to carve out space. On a personal level, I'll just share quickly, get off your phone when you're in the supermarket checkout line, hmm. right? So we talked already, Glenn, about eye contact and how some of these things feel so difficult. Hmm. Practice. Social muscles require strengthening. It requires practice. Just this time, keep your phone in your pocket. If you catch eyes with someone in front of you, hello, smile, right? It doesn't have to be a big old conversation, 
Yeah. Next time you're at the coffee shop, try leaving your headphones off, yeah. right? Or on the subway, try leaving your headphones off. Just see how it feels. Next time you're on an elevator, don't hammer the closed door button. Let someone <laughs> ride with you, right? Little things uh, add up to these big muscle builds, but they have to be part of your daily work. They can't be sometimes things. It's so true. And, you know, and it's funny, these things just create barriers. You know, I see these little white things in people's ear and it's just such a barrier to say, don't talk to me. Don't, yeah. you know, like, it, 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 and and we're doing it all the time. I, I'm constantly surveying um, one of my coaches years ago, saw me walking down Young Street on my phone and right. I was complaining about stress. And she said, you know, one of the things you can do is stop when you're walking somewhere, that's your break time. Put your phone away, just walk. Like you're going to walk. walk into somebody and just walk and look around. And so that was, I don't know how many years ago. And so I'm, I have to say I'm 99% good at doing that. Yeah. And, and, but it allows me to see other people. And it's amazing when you start looking and it's, it, we create these things that create more social distance. And yet loneliness is an epidemic right? We're more lonely, yeah. we're more depressed, we're, we're, we're dealing with all of these feelings of isolation. And yet we've got these little devices that subliminally yeah. send those messages, right? Yeah. And you talk about risk taking, you know, if, if let's say I walk into a coffee shop line, and you're sitting there with your headphones on, before it might have felt like a little risk just to say hello to you. Mm. Now it almost feels double because I'm asking yeah. you to remove your headphones yes. and decide if this interaction is worth it. Yes. Right. And so yes. I, I have a girlfriend who's like, you know, trying to to date a bit. And she's like, I don't want to get approached by people the way I used to. And I'm like, sweetie, you wear your headphones everywhere. Right. You're, 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 you're making the lift. You know, it's a double risk now, because if you take the effort to remove yes. and this isn't for you, yes. it feels even harder to swallow that. And so it's, it's also creating that environment. We need to put in the reps, but also if this is important to you, as you said, I think you said it beautifully, Glenn, don't put barriers up where this social muscle could stand to be strengthened because you may not have to say anything. Part yeah. of your rep building is somebody may just try to say hello to you. Yeah. And that's also repetition building. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so everybody, I know we are having trouble with the chat and Jen, yeah. Jen put in uh, the comment to us that the elevator thought that was just me. Ha ha. No, it's definitely <laughs> not just you, Jen. No. All the time when I'm in a hurry. Um, right. that's selfish, selfish behavior on my part. <laughs> um, so feel free to pop things in the chat. I think also the Q and A might work. You can give it a try. You might be able to see everybody's questions and answers. So Sure. Hence here, I think this is such an interesting topic. So what would you like to know about um, Good Awkward? I'm going to keep going, but I'm going to keep watching the chat. So what, what are you curious about? One of the things that's coming up for me as you're talking, and I, you know, Marshall Goldsmith was one of my mentors, and he co-wrote mm. a book uh, several years ago now with Sally Helgeson that was around the 12 behaviors that women do. Yep. Right, that hold I have up. it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> book. Great book. Yeah. And I, you know, once again, like when I read Marshall's book, What Got You Here Won't Get, Won't Get You There, I'm like, okay, out of 21 or 22 things, I've got 16 of them. That's great. <laughs> and then with Sally's, I thought, oh, yeah, confident, self actualized woman. I've been on executive teams. I don't let men talk over me, da 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 da, all of that kind of, you know, bravado. And then I read Sally's book and I'm like, oh boy, I'm doing more of these 12 behaviors than I like to admit to. And I'm yeah. curious about this feeling of awkwardness, particularly in work settings where it is, you know, I put my hand up, I voiced my opinion fearlessly. I did these things and it landed flat. Do you think the feeling of awkwardness, do you think there's a difference between how men feel awkward and how women feel awkward, men's ability to let go of that feeling quicker than women, any sort of perspective yeah. on that. I'm curious. Yes. Yes. Several. Um, one of which, and I think this is important is this is still something that requires testing of our environment, right? Mm -hmm. Testing of psychological safety of what can we say? So I, I want to make a few notes here. Too many people confuse awkwardness with ineptitude. And we're not talking about the same thing. We're not talking about awkwardness being inept. So I, I use the metaphor in the book of I would not want to hire an inept anesthesiologist, right? but I'd be perfectly fine hiring an awkward one. Right. So when we're talking about awkwardness, we're not talking about a lack of skill or lack of competence. What yeah. we're talking about is the very natural and human tendency to have the occasional misstep, embarrassing moment and blunder. Mm. And so data actually says that when you are someone 
who is generally seen as smart, competent, capable, knows what they're doing, and you occasionally misspeak, get it wrong, commit a blunder. There's actually a name for it in social psychology. It's called the pratfall effect. Mm -hmm. When you occasionally commit a blunder, not only does it not negate all of that other stuff, mm -hmm. but it actually makes you come across as warm and likable because your lack of perfection actually puts people at ease for the most mm. part. It humanizes mm. you. It knocks mm. you off this pedestal of polished perfection that many women try to put on. Mm. Now that said, women and women of color specifically are still disproportionately scrutinized mm. to the point where confidence often in, in, in some environments needs to look like flawlessness. Right. Right. And I don't want to diminish the truth in that in certain environments, especially ones that were, you know, all business environments, just from a number standpoint, were largely, you know, created in, in generations past by white mm -hmm. cisgendered heterosexual men. Yep. And so we're still working through those norms in the workplace. But I think in some organizations more than others, anything that looks like a, a misstep, there is still a disproportionate level of scrutiny. For women and women of color. And so that's why testing for, is this okay? How are other leaders, you know, embracing this quality? Does it seem okay? Are they punished for it? Can we dip our toe in the water with strategically using humor in an awkward moment, right? Or, or putting ourselves out there. We do have to test. I don't want to speak so broadly as to say, everyone just let your awkward fly at all moments, you know, on purpose. It really depends on where you work and how those things are seen and appreciated. Yeah. And I do think there's a gender thing. It's it's interesting because one of the ways that I, um, I, I got feedback, especially early on when I was starting the business, I even use a lot of self-deprecating humor. And yeah. that's a British thing. I'm, I'm British. Sure. And yeah. So it's just so ingrained to be very self-deprecating. And got feedback that what I was doing was diminishing myself through my self-deprecating mm. humor. And yet I have a colleague, uh, it's a colleague that you and I both know, who is very yeah. self-deprecating. He gets up on stage and he will tell you he's the worst coach in the world. And yet he's written the biggest coaching book in the world. And, you know, all of that kind of thing. And I'm like, what's the difference with me trying uh -huh. to, you know, like, and, and that awkwardness where it's not awkward when he does it, but there's something awkward about me doing it, which makes me diminish myself if I'm not mm. careful. So it's, I find these lines are quite tricky to navigate sometimes. For yeah. Some it's a great call out. There are some rules. So, you know, one of the chapters in my book, I talk about using humor as it relates mm. to awkwardness and it is a great tool for diffusing awkwardness, but there are some rules. And I do believe that some of the, the gender nuances can play a role in this, but as it relates to self-deprecation, generally, it is a great technique to help people relax, but we have to be careful that our choice of self-deprecation doesn't speak to our skill set or competence right. or capability. Right. So for example, if you're a tax accountant and you misstep about something, you can always say, you know, it's a good thing I'm not, you know, running hurdles outside today or my design skills are terrible or, you know, something that feels yeah. a bit, you know, humanizing again to diffuse the awkward tension, Yeah, but it should be not directly tied to your area of skill, because then it can be perceived as a diminishment or a minimizing. And yes. we don't want to do that. That's not yeah. helping any of any of our causes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's a great way to differentiate that. Um, so there's, uh, so I love Neelam caught herself mm -hmm. having a contamination thinking uh, moment and, and was able to, it sounds like, shift yeah. to the redemptive state so that's terrific already and Seth's got a question that she's thrown in the Q&A and it's an Hi. awkward question which is great um, I love it <laughs> so what do you do if you cause the awkwardness um going through surgical menopause so having a hard time with the emotions change of facial temperature etc do I own it I just read an article that women leave the workforce during this time due to difficulties it causes Yes, mm -hmm. we don't talk about menopause at work, do we? And no, and I know can happen in there. Um, so, what do you do if you're the cause of the awkwardness with people? What's the best yeah. advice? So, I love I love the question, and you know, I just want to be very honest and transparent out of the gate. I don't have specific hands on experience with those you know particular uh, situations at work. I have not yet been in in the position to experience them on the whole. But what I will say is. Something I said at the top, which maybe is worth repeating here, 
the avoidance of awkwardness increases awkwardness. So if you feel that some of those things are showing up in your day to day and that people potentially have questions about, ironically and counterintuitively, naming something playfully just out of the jump is actually the fastest way for all of that tension in the air to immediately diffuse. You know, it's it's naming the elephant in the room in a way that feels good to you and comfortable to you. You know, I, I, I did work, I remember once with a woman who was going through some sort of treatment for a health thing. And uh, I forget what it was, but it was, it caused excessive perspiration, like excessive, even to the point on Zoom where she was just shining and, and dabbing constantly. Mm. And the truth of the matter is it could have been awkward if she was just dabbing throughout the meeting without any context or explanation. And she didn't give us the whole, you know, her whole health history, but early on, she kind of made a playful joke. And I wish I could remember exactly how she said it about, you know, while I wish I could tell you this shine is just my natural glow, I've had a health issue lately that's making me a little, little shiny. So just if you see me dab, that's why. But she, she owned it. She was confident in this thing that otherwise could have been embarrassing that she had to, to do on the call. And immediately, not only did we all relax and no longer care, we loved her more for it. Hmm. We immediately loved her more for it. And then every time she got a little shiny, you know, I forget, she used some word like her glow or her sparkle or her shimmer or something. It was, it was a perfect example of taking what is for most folks, sweating excessively is awkward and embarrassing in the best of cases, especially at work. And she made it this playful moment of what to us looked like confidence. Like she just owned it fully. And so I'd be curious if there's a way that you can take this experience that feels very uncomfortable for you, but to just kind of, if if necessary, own it early and sort of make it your own and put it aside if you feel it's distracting to others. I think, I think what I, as I, I, as I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about these sorts of situations, so, and it's that going back to what you were talking about at the start about this is a self-conscious piece. And, and yep. so it's, it's so interesting, right? Because there's, things that I would never feel awkward about that my husband will go, that was so awkward. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And so, it, it, right. so I find these moments that are very instructive to kind of reflect what was awkward about that for you? What was it that made you feel the way mm -hmm. that you felt? So I think there's some great self insight pieces that tell you a lot about your values. And I think, as you said at the start, you know, how you want to be perceived, the kind of person you want to be the presenting image that we all have. I think the other side too, though, is there's something about like when I what you made me think of in that that sort of response is this idea of transparency. Transparency can reduce awkwardness because if if we continue to be you know sweating profusely in a meeting and nobody mm -hmm. knows what's going on, we will all start telling ourselves stories about what's going right. on with you. Right? We'll worry. We'll, we'll think, worry. Oh, we could be yeah. we worry, or we could think, mm -hmm. oh gosh, they're really nervous. They don't really have their right. act together. Like right. you don't know based on each person's own filter and bias set, right? Mm -hmm. How they're viewing that behavior. And yet, as soon as somebody would, like, it sounds like your colleague who just said, hey, you know, health issue, it's causing me to glow a little bit more than usual. Mm -hmm. say, oh, okay, that's what that is. And then I can move on and I'm not distracted in my brain about wondering what's actually happening to you in that moment. So, so much of taking that risk to um, be transparent, to, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, uh, open up the conversation around the situations can lower the bar on this, these awkward feelings, I'm guessing for both the, the receiver, the people who are feeling awkward or the people that are feeling they're causing the awkwardness. Yes, that's exactly right. And I, you know, I think the, to add one more layer to this, mm. yes, while saying that early feels risky, you know, it does. I don't, I don't want to diminish that. It can feel like, woof, saying that out loud up front. That's, that's a yeah. bold thing. Yeah, it can be. But there's also another layer to this, which is there's a, a body of research that I explore in the book about catering and performing, which is sort of rather than coming in transparent or like your full self in that moment, mm. we cater to meet others' expectations. So in this case, this woman, if she wasn't willing to have her rag on the screen and was just sort of trying to push through, mm -hmm. then there's actually that type of performing to meet others' expectations to try to be someone we're not in that moment, there's now more and more research that talks about how that diminishes our performance because mm. catering to meet others' expectations is exhausting. It's exhausting. It's exhausting to pretend that you're not dealing with this post 
you know, the surgical uh, situation that you mentioned to pretend that you're not is actually work. And mm -hmm. we forget that there is a, an a, men a mental and emotional lift of pretending that something doesn't exist. In fact, ironically, it is less work to take that little risk up front and to say the thing and to get to relax the yeah. rest of the meeting, the rest yeah. of the day versus the amount of mental, emotional, and sometimes physical lift it requires to keep up airs because we think that's what other people find palatable or what they yeah. appreciate. And the data is really strong on that in the last couple of years that performing does us no good. Yeah, that's such a great share. Um, and it, it kind of, I see Neelam's put in a, a question there that I'm, I'm thinking there's maybe a pivot off of what you've just said. So her mm -hmm. question is, what do you do if you sense awkwardness in the room of people where you may be playing a listener role? I typically mm -hmm. step in and share what I notice. Curious on what you would do when you sense it as a third party. Mm -hmm. Now, I love this question. And I think these questions come up in many contexts, but one that it comes up a lot in is potentially a diversity, equity, inclusion conversation, mm -hmm. right? There's a mispronunciation of a name, mm -hmm. things like that, right? You're a third party and you're like, okay, they're not saying something, but I really want to say something, right? Mm -hmm. Am I going to make things more awkward? Mm -hmm. You know, I want to, in the spirit of the Marshall and, and Sally, you know, stuff, we don't want to use minimizing statements or qualifiers, but there are still gentle things you can say to introduce something with kindness to hedge some of the awkwardness, right? Hey, I just want to throw this into the room because I think we'll all be better for it. Or, or hey, I just want to bring this up before the moment passes, but it's all, you know, men out of love and thinking, hey, we can, we can do better next time or something, right? Something mm -hmm. that shows that this is being shared into the room, not to make others feel uncomfortable, but in the spirit of care, in the spirit mm -hmm. of team, right? Um, something like that can often allow us to find the courage to speak an awkward moment into the room mm -hmm. without worrying that we're going to increase someone else's discomfort or potentially create it for the first time. Because sometimes again, if, you know, let's just say again, you and I are in the room, I am calling you Glane over and over and over. You don't correct me and neither does anyone else. In that moment, I actually wouldn't feel awkward about it because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize mm -hmm. only the people in the room feel awkward. Yeah. But if I realized, then that would be a different thing. And so everything is on a, you know, on a continuum. Nothing yeah. is linear. There are certain situations where you get to make the decision. Is this worth me inviting some potential awkwardness into the room? Is this important enough? Mm -hmm. If so, get some talk tracks ready about how you can enter that comment into the room. Not every battle is worth fighting as it relates mm -hmm. to awkwardness though. And I think that's important too. Sometimes, you know, depending on the scale, depending on the seniority, you know, sometimes it's our leaders who can make team members feel awkward. Sometimes it's the other way around. So again, there are some general rules when we have an awkward moment and we're trying to use humor. The general rule is you should not kick down, but it's kind of okay to punch up, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, we, we don't want to say, you know, to a, to a more junior member, wow, you really, you know, completely screwed that report up. What were you thinking? And we, you know, then it's awkward in all the bad ways. Yeah. But when a team is playfully jabbing the boss for their, you know, misspeak or something, you know, that often is perceived differently because there's a power dynamic at play. Yeah. Um, so just, just, just have to be thoughtful about where and when and how yeah. you do those things. It's funny because you're making me think of a scenario that a colleague was telling me about. And I think DE and I is one area that can be a hotbed of awkwardness, actually. Yeah, for uh, sure. And and she was sharing how she was in a meeting with uh, two senior people, more senior than her. Um, and they referred to another senior executive woman as having, I will use the word cojones. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Got so it. it was, you know. I know meant as a compliment, sure. but not, you know, this is a very kind of stereotypical derogatory remark, right? Really, as, as a woman, I have to have cojones to be, you know, seen as credible. And yeah. this individual said to me, I didn't say anything. And I felt like I should have, right? Mm. And that, and so when you talk about lines, like when you're in a meeting and things like that come up, you hear, you hear somebody say something insensitive, use a word that's insensitive and that type of thing. 
when there is that power and power imbalance, um, Mm -hmm. something does need to be said, what's your advice on how to go about doing that? What's the best way to start that kind of conversation? My favorite talk tracks around this involve some variation of the phrase, you know, I don't tell everyone this, but I'm telling you because I care about you and believe that this will make things better, Mm. right? Or some, some version of that, because here's the truth. Yeah. Let's just say leader Bob is the one who used the quote unquote cojones word. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I didn't care about leader Bob that much, or if I didn't much care for him as a leader, guess what? I would save my energy. I would save my breath. I wouldn't bother having the conversation. And more importantly, if I didn't think he was capable of change, I would save my breath. Mm. But the fact that I'm bringing this to him means that I think he's the type of person who would respond well to what I'm going to say. And that actually wants to be more mindful and probably just didn't notice Mm. what he said. And so the goal would be to say something along those lines of, Hey, you know, I don't, this, you can, and, and again, naming awkwardness is a power way to diffuse it. This feels a bit awkward to say, and I wouldn't say it to everyone, but I'm saying it to you because, and then blah, blah, blah. But I think it, again, it softens it when you say that, you know, I'm fighting through my own emotion of awkwardness about saying this to you because it's important enough to me. And I believe that you're someone who would appreciate hearing that and is capable of making those adjustments in the future. Yeah. And I, and, and I think really when, what, when I hear this, it's really getting into what is your intention in this conversation? Is your intention mm-hmm. to shame the person? Right. Right. Feel small. Is it to um, belittle them or is it to actually help and support and yeah. hold up? Right. And I think often that's where we sort of, you know, we've got to be clearer in our own minds. What's my intention in this situation? What am I actually trying to do here? Right. Yeah. What's the story that I've been telling myself about this person and what they're all about? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, with this muscle development, this can be something. And I think when you think of confident people, you tend to think of this as sometimes it'll be, I'm sitting on this and I'm going to go talk to manager Bob later. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those of us who have really honed these muscles find that the confidence to say something in the moment. Right. And, and it could be a Manager Bob, that's awkward. She's a female. She does not have cojones, right? And you can be playful about it in in the moment. Now that's sort of raising the stakes, right? On being able to do something like that in real time. But with with practice, you know, so in the case of my high five, when it wasn't a high five, right? He was putting his hand in front of his face. Pretty immediately, you know, he, when he said, I'm trying to tell you to stop. I think I responded with, Wow major cringe. I really read that wrong. Right. Totally, yeah. totally misread that. Can we try that again? Right. And yeah. he, he laughed. I laughed. Yeah. Our shoulders relaxed, but yeah. by practicing responding to it and owning that very, very quickly, mm-hmm. it actually allowed us to move on. And I will argue that made him like me a bit more. It made us a little bit closer mm-hmm. because I was able to take that moment and not let it become a deterrent. In fact, by leaning into it and naming how cringy it was, it let us move on. And it actually made the conversation a bit lighter from that point on. Yeah. 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 I, I, and I think, because I think, uh, and we, and I don't know if we talked about this in this or pre the call. So, uh, you know, for, uh, everybody who's listening in, I think you're very good on your feet, right? You're, you're quick on your feet and you can go with that. What if you're somebody though, who is, I think of my husband, my husband is not quick on his feet. He takes time to think about this. He is the person who will, oh, you know, he'll tell me a scenario and I'll go, well, why did you say that? Why did you say this? And you should have said that. And you should like, immediately I'm firing all these things at him. What, what advice do you have to people who in those moments don't have the go-to to to go there and maybe start to spiral immediately what what sort of suggestions could you have there yeah um my my response would be twofold is you know I agree with you first off that some people are internal processors Mm -hmm. right I'm I'm an external processor Mm -hmm. meaning you fire something at me and I maybe what some would perceive as quick quick on their feet is also sometimes I'm synthesizing my response out loud Mm -hmm. with you right which makes it seem as though I'm quick on my feet. Mm-hmm. Others are internal processors. I've got um, a couple of private clients who are through and through introverts that actually would self-identify as quite shy. And yeah. so some of the language we've been playing with when they're 
put into a spot like that is, you know, th this probably applies more on a one-on-one -on -one or in a small group, but they will say, please don't mistake this as an awkward silence. I'm, I'm just thinking, mm. right. They actually just have, have a talk track that they put into the room mm. that, you know, one of the most things that one of the most awkward things for a lot of people is a silence. They are yes. concerned that by not responding quickly or by letting the silence hang in the air, it creates a perception from the other mm. of their level of competence, their level of capability. So if that is you, I'm not asking you to, you know, swallow the ocean hole here, but creating a talk track around, you know, please don't mistake what might sound like an awkward silence for me not having an answer. Um, just give me a second to formulate, right? Mm -hmm. That is an extreme act of confidence, but then also gives you the space to do this. Now I'll just share because I feel like it's valuable here. Uh, my husband is an extrovert too, but he's an internal processor. Meaning when we argue, he's very frustrated by me. Because I am just firing, firing. And he has to literally stop and say, Hannah, give me a chance to think about how I want to respond. Mm -hmm. You're already on to the next thing. Give me a chance to think about how I want to respond. And so it has become a matter of practice where he's come up with a talk track to say, before you say anything else, just know that I'm still thinking about this. Give me a second. And it forces me to quiet down a bit and say, okay, this is not him having an awkward silence. He's, yeah. he's processing, but yeah. he's needed to come up with a talk track to help manage those moments. Uh, yeah. I think that's, that's such helpful advice. And it's, and it's what we sort of, you know, work with leaders on when you're trying to build a new behavior muscle, if one yeah. of your muscles is in awkward moments, I clam up and I freeze up and I don't want to do creating these little phrases, creating these mm -hmm. little go-to things that can become something that you can go into autopilot on say in that moment, such a great strategy, right? We've got to build these little muscles. Yeah. I, I mean, even on my own, one of my own growth edges is not being so on my feet, mm -hmm. not being so responsive. I will borderline. And I say this with no uh, admonishment on my part, but it's my, my tendency in excess is impulsive. Like mm -hmm. I wish I can think more before I speak. And so one of my own growth edges is not to fill the air and not to rely on the thinking on my feet and to actually pause long enough to say, you know, part of me wants to respond right away, but what I'm going to do is actually sit in this quiet for a moment. Let me think about how I want to engage with this or respond to this. That's my own awkward growth edge. Yeah. It's easy for, it's easy for me to, it's harder for me to just slow it down and let the air hang for a bit. Yeah. I mean, and this is it, right? We all, every strength has this corresponding liability, right? Mm -hmm. And so for those of us that I'm, I can really relate to what you're saying. And a lot of it is going to shut up. <laughs> yeah. But the sun <laughs> yeah. think before you speak. Yeah. Uh, so this book, what's your greatest hope for anybody reading this book? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, my greatest hope. And I feel like it's already, you know, coming true. And the feedback that I'm getting is just people feeling incredibly seen, Mm. And that that's, you know, what, what I keep hearing and it makes my heart sing. They're like, ah, just no one has put words to these things that I felt for a really, really long time mm. and didn't understand, didn't know why it was holding me back. I hope they feel seen and I hope they feel equipped with a tactical toolkit of things they can say, mental exercises they can do, ways that they can reframe this emotion into something that they actually not only expect, but ideally look forward to when it comes to all those transitional moments or inflection points in their growth, because the truth is it's not going away. The feeling is here to stay. It's your ability to stay in them and actually take ownership of them that is going to unlock everything. And so I hope you find yourself with a fresh new strategy and a set of tools on how to do that. Mm. And I think, you know, when we were chatting earlier, you were saying, you know, we were talking about the response the book's got and it really mm -hmm. feels like this is a book of the moment right now, right? <laughs> I hope so. It's a nice thing to say, but I uh, hope so to a degree. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? Like, what 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 do you think is going on broad, more broadly that's causing this to be such a topic for people? Yeah. I, you know, I think there's two camps. I think there's folks who identify as socially awkward as a trait, right? As a personality trait, who've never had something that's been written just for them in the workplace. Right. But then we've also got what we were talking about earlier, which is the increase of the experience of awkwardness as an emotional state. And that's so much contributed by 
you know, being thrown into new workplace structures post pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's being, you know, exacerbated by these societal structures where we swipe and we ping and we don't actually have to have conversations if we don't want mm -hmm. to. It is very easy to avoid. I mean, in a given day, you can avoid social interaction with another human for the entire day. You can have Absolutely. DoorDash dropped off on your, you know, front porch. You can, you can avoid humans all day if you really want to. And I think increasingly people are wondering why it is so challenging and why it feels so awkward to be around people. This is why, yeah. this is why. And I think it just gives some voice to that, to that feeling. Yeah. I think, I think this is, uh, such an important thing that you've brought to the table. And I think I'm, I'm thinking as a parent, you know, there's so many great tools. The book is fantastic for all of us uh, on the call. I highly recommend it. Um, so Thank chance you. for you to sort of, uh, you know, stay in touch with Henna, definitely buy the book. It is um, worth the read. And as a parent of a young adult, <sighs> I feel like there's just some really great coaching tips to help her kind of really navigate the world. So Hannah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just, uh, it's funny that you say that we're, we're teasing my publisher and I a good awkward for young adults, like a teen really? version. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about it because a few people have said, gosh, my, I want my teen to read this. And my, my teen has read it and yeah. found it very impactful. But I think if we wrote a version just for young adults and teens, yeah. um, we're, we're talking about it. So yeah. if anyone else oh. has young adults in their life and you think that's a good idea, tell me because I'm trying to gather data. Yes. On. Oh, well, I think it's a great idea. So yeah. Hannah, thank you for being here. It was a pleasure, everybody. There's Hannah's information. Definitely look her up, get in touch and uh, download the book. I'm going to be sending out a summary next week. And of course, next month we have our friend, Stephen, known as Shed Shedleski, who is going to be talking ah. about his new book, Speak Up yes. Health Work. So join us for that. And then if you're interested in any of the work we do, one-to-one -one coaching, group coaching, or team coaching, uh, reach out and uh, set up a connection call. We're happy to talk to you about what you might need in any of those areas. But thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your week. And Hannah, thank you again for being with us here today. Really, Thank you. This was a blast. Absolutely.